Um, my name is Nicole Minerly. Natasha Minerly. We both own a vegan cafe together in Wilson, Wilson Manor. Manor. Um, our mom was vegetarian since she was like four years old. She just decided one day she wanted to be vegetarian and then went vegan later in life before, she, before we were born. Yep. There was a few years where we just were vegetarian and not vegan, but then for the rest of our life we've been vegan. So I think the only reason we're vegan is actually ethical, not health related or anything else. Um, We've been vegetarian our whole life, so when we see meat, it doesn't remotely look like food to us. It looks like a dead animal. Like if we saw roadkill on the road, it would look just as appetizing as like a plate of meat. So having no idea what it tastes like and having no way to associate it with food, it looks like disgusting and horrible and there's like no desire at all to eat it. We know that cheese tastes good and we know that milk tastes good. <laughs> but once we found out how much it's actually harming animals to eat the byproducts of the dairy industry, we couldn't do that either. Before, when we were just vegetarian, we justified it to ourselves by saying that we didn't want to kill anything, but taking dairy from a cow didn't hurt the cow and it didn't kill it, so it was morally okay. And it took us a little bit to find out, kind of from some horrifying videos, that they're actually hurt quite a lot, even just if you take their milk or eggs or byproducts. I guess it would matter for others to be vegan for the same reason it would matter for us to be vegan, just to cause the least harm to the worlds that you can. I don't think there's any justification for hurting animals in that way. We're not in a situation where we need it for survival. It doesn't help people be healthier. It doesn't help the environment. There's literally no reason for it. All it does is cause harm and suffering. Like if you were someone stranded in the middle of nowhere, Alaska, and the only thing to eat was an egg, maybe, but nobody's in that situation. I mean, most people in daily life are not in that situation. So it would be wonderful if everybody was vegan and we could reduce the amount of suffering and harm that we inflict upon the world. Oh, so I think the best way for us to encourage people to be vegan is just by giving them vegan food because it's, I think it's the biggest roadblock for a lot of people. Like, I feel like the roadblock should be moral or ethical, and once you make that decision, it should be easy. But a lot of people think that they can't do it, and the only way for them to know that they can is to try vegan food and see that it wouldn't be the end of the universe. Yeah, and a lot of the times, if people just eat vegan food often enough, um, they'll get used to the idea that it's just food. It's not any different. So. Since we like cook for a living, we get to experience so many people trying vegan food for what they think is the first time. <laughs> and a lot of people will say things like, I've never had vegan food my entire life before, I've never eaten it. And so we'll just be like, well... Yeah, but you never had a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, or a salad, or french Oreos. fries, or anything. <laughs> it's like, you've never had vegan food? Really? But people have this idea of what vegan food is. Um, we have so many cultures have dishes that are just vegan. You don't have to change them. There's nothing fake or substitute about it, especially with Mediterranean food or Thai food or Indian, Indian food. food. So the concept that vegan food is fake food is one of the things that you have to break past. Yeah. Because people focus too much on like substitutes for meat and substitutes for cheese and they feel that it's lacking because they never, they never think of it as something that just is. It's not like a replacement for something else. Yeah, especially with cheese. Like, if you have nothing but dishes with vegan cheese, you're going to be like, oh, vegan food is terrible. But if you eat dishes that never needed it in the first place, then you're not missing anything. And there's so much flavor you can get from, like, vegetables and fruits that people don't think about, because a lot of people are just used to, like, vegetables that have been put into a pot and boiled until they're literally killed and there's no flavor left and it's just mush. And that's or it's just a side to the main meal instead of being the main meal. So I think that's our way of trying to help people go vegan is just by giving them food and having them experience what vegan food could be. And a lot of times we don't even tell people the food is vegan until after they try it because people have such a like internal bias against the word yeah. vegan and what it means. Yeah, and if you're like if we're selling food at a booth at a festival and we have falafel sandwiches and hummus and it is vegan, but nobody thinks of it as being vegan. So we've had a lot of people who are surprised later when you tell them it's vegan or sometimes you get people who are mad at you like you tricked me into eating vegan food how could you do that to me 
<laughs> which is just silly. Yeah, but eventually it kind of changes people's minds. And I think that's a better way for us to try to convince people to be vegan because we're not very good at talking to people or persuading them through words. No. Um, we're lucky that we don't face a lot of challenges because we have a cafe, we eat most of our own food, so that makes it so much easier. And our whole family. immediate family is vegetarian, so that makes it easier too because when you have Thanksgiving or Christmas or any meals with your family, you're doing it together. And you don't have people constantly trying to convince you that you shouldn't be doing it and it's bad for you. And so the only real challenge I think we have is when we travel. So especially to other countries where there could be like a language barrier. So you have a hard time trying to figure out what's vegan or not vegan. We've traveled a lot of different places like Japan and China and Korea. And occasionally it was really hard to find vegan food or to understand what was vegan and what wasn't. Um, we lived in Alaska for a couple of years and that was a little tough because the food available wasn't was limited. It was super limited. It wasn't the same as it is here in Florida where there's like an abundance of fruits and vegetables and different cuisines and cultures. So there were like a couple of months we lived off of just like rice and salad. Yeah. But on a whole like in our day to day life it's really easy. It's not challenging at all. And it seems to be getting easier like every year. Like now you can get soy milk from Walmart and Publix and even gas stations and all sorts of random places. Oh, definitely. Um, I re really regret the time that I was vegetarian and not vegan. I think part of the problem is that since we were raised that way, we didn't really have an opportunity to think about it and to make our own moral choices. So we went vegetarian when we went to college and it was kind of like freedom, we can do whatever we want now. <laughs> And then later we kind of realized that it was the wrong thing to do and wished we had made that kind of thoughtful decision before that. Yeah, because in some senses it's really easy when you're raised that way. You don't think about it. It's just your way of life. So I think for us it took a bit later to actually realize why it was important. Yeah, it's different when your parents tell you to do it and when you make the decision yourself. But I am very, very glad that we were raised that way. Yeah, on a whole, it makes it easier. And I think that we're always finding out things all the time. Like, we're constantly discovering like something else that probably isn't good su to support or good to eat. And yeah. <laughs> sometimes I think we wish we didn't keep finding out those things because <laughs> it would make life easier. <laughs> so it's probably good to like sometimes be a little easier on yourself and be like, okay, it's a process. You're making progress and that's all you can do. Well, I think it probably does broaden your creativity a little more because it's really easy to throw like a lot of cheese and butter on something and make it delicious to anybody. Or just serve nothing but burgers and fries and things that don't actually take preparation um, or thought. So. But we change our menu every week too, which doesn't help. So <laughs> it doesn't we, help at all. <laughs> but we have so much fun every time we find a new ingredient or a new spice that we've never heard of. We love trying new foods and finding new combinations. So I think um, in a way it's limiting, but in a way it opens up so much more creativity because a lot of the flavor comes from the ingredients themselves. It's not being buried in other things. It's like, and a lot of it comes from the spicing that you put on it. So instead of giving it flavor with cheese and butter and milk or animal fat, you're giving it flavor through spices and oils and different things that you wouldn't normally use. And there's like a million different ways to flavor a carrot that make it taste amazing. <laughs> so I guess it is limiting in that respect, but it's also like a great possibility for creativity. Yes. Oh, it gets ridiculously interesting. <laughs> I mean, there's so many different fruits and spices and plants that, like, we've never seen in even this country until we've traveled and got exposed to them. So there's so many just different flavors that you didn't even know existed. I think most people grow up and they think of fruit as, like, apples and bananas and maybe pears or mangoes if you're feeling exotic. Um, we grew up like that in Colorado because there was such a, a limited amount of fruit available compared to Florida. And when we came to Florida, we thought it was like the most fantastic, exotic wonderland. There was like mangoes everywhere, coconuts lychees, everywhere, lychees. Dragon fruits, just, and every time we find a new thing, like seashell, which is an herb that tastes kind of like basil, basil. but sharper, it opens a whole new world of things that you can make. 
or even or, juniper berries or or yuzu which yuzu. we tasted in japan it's like grapefruit but with like a piney citrus flavor so every time we find something new we get really like, ridiculously excited like here's another possibility another and like even having like traveled and going out of our way to like seek out new things there's still like a million things we haven't tried before and there's probably a million more things we didn't even know existed yeah, there's so many different things out there to experience that it's kind of sad to just limit yourself to the same basic meals every single day, like eggs and bacon for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> Hamburgers for lunch. <laughs> like if you look at like the menus in schools and places, it's kind of really sad that that's what people are taught food is. It's like just the basic, basic. Um, I hate to say it, but probably not as much of our diet as raw as it should be. Like we eat salads and stuff, but we really like hot food like soups, soups. and curries and stir fries. And roasted vegetables. So we don't eat as much raw as probably would be good for you, but... I don't really like see the point in going 100% raw anyway, because I think for a lot of people it's harder and it doesn't seem like it. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I could keep a raw diet. I know. <laughs> There's, There's so too much. many good ways to cook your food. Yes. <laughs> it's done. Yeah. <laughs> mangoes. You're allergic to mangoes. It's yeah. a tragedy since it's we tragedy. live in Florida. Oh, and I accidentally, in China when we were teaching there, I accidentally ate shrimp. And I found out I'm allergic to shrimp. But I would have never known that my whole life because I've never eaten it. <laughs> so for all we know, we could be allergic to like all, all of those things that we've just never <laughs> just never been exposed to it. So I'm assuming I'm allergic to shrimp too. <laughs> I'm not gonna like try to find out or anything, but <laughs> Well we kind of have a reaction to papaya too, but it's not like bad enough that we care. We're still gonna eat it. <laughs> And like weirdly, we only got allergic to fruit, to mangoes when we moved to Florida because we lived in Colorado before that and we were never allergic to mangoes. But I think we only had it like once every like... So many years. years or so, so. And then we come to Florida and there's a beautiful mango tree in our backyard and then we... We eat like a hundred of them and then we're extremely allergic from then on. <laughs> so that could change later, I guess. I hope yeah. so. <laughs> Hopefully if we maybe never eat it for a while, we'll stop being allergic to it again or something. <laughs> It was terrible. <laughs> so in elementary school, I think we had a peanut butter sandwich for lunch every single day that we were in school. Um, and it wasn't even peanut butter and jelly. For some reason, they had peanut butter and white bread with a slice of American cheese on top. And I'll never forget that because it was like the most disgusting thing so in the world. So we take the cheese off and we just have bread with peanut butter. <laughs> <laughs> and for like the three years we were in elementary school, that's like all we ate. It took us until we were in college again to be able to eat peanut butter. <laughs> But um, we were homeschooled for a good chunk of it, so that was easier. And once we learned how to cook on our own, then that we had no problem because we could pack our own lunches. We can bring our own food with us wherever we went. And admittedly, the first few times we tried to cook, it was absolutely horrible and nobody could eat it. But we there kept trying. There was a couple of times we had to like actually throw our pans away because whatever we did fused to the pan and we literally couldn't get it out. <laughs> our parents would come home and like wonder what on earth we did. <laughs> we didn't even know. <laughs> Our poor brothers like grew up um, slightly traumatized by trying all our cooking. <laughs> but that's how you learn, so it's good. <laughs> yeah, the school lunches were like absolutely horrible. It was yeah. like peanut butter, they had like the canned fruit that had sugar syrup sauce on it, so it didn't even taste like fruit, it tasted like sugar. Those like milk cartons and orange juice cartons that don't taste anything like orange juice. Yeah. Yeah, I still don't understand how anyone thinks that that's healthy for kids to eat every single day. Just milk and french fries and pizza slices <laughs> pizza slices and boiled to death vegetables so if i could see why a lot of people would think vegan food is bad if that's what they grew up on because if you're just eating like boiled carrots and peaches soaked in corn syrup and that's your idea of the vegetarian options it's really sad <laughs> so my boyfriend was 
a regular carnivore when I met him. <laughs> regular carnivore. <laughs> but after I started, he started eating with me every meal and I started cooking food for him. He became vegetarian, I think only in like a month, not even. So he still isn't vegan, but he's never eaten meat again. So I think he could see in my face how much it bothered me. And he keeps saying that he could either cook his own poorly cooked meat on his own or he could eat all the good food that we make. So he'd rather <laughs> just eat the good food. <laughs> um, I don't think it's really like impacted our relationship with our friends at all. Like most of them are pretty understanding about it. Um, I don't think anyone's ever like gotten mad at us for it or tried to pressure us into eating. Um, when we were kids, there were a lot of people that would like try to sneak meat on your plate just to see what your reaction would be and things like that. Yeah, because a couple of our mom's family um, didn't like the idea that she was ra raising us vegan at all. They thought that it wasn't good for you, um, especially when it came to our brothers because they were boys and boys need meat to grow healthy and strong. We're girls, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but we... I think once we got older and we weren't around like little kids, it wasn't so much of the try to like, haha, sneak the vegan meat and see how they react sort of thing. So now pretty much everyone's understanding about it. All of us, I think, grew up pretty normally. Like we didn't have any health problems when we were, actually we almost never got sick when we were kids. We never got colds or flus or anything. So. Um, our brothers, like everyone was like, oh, they're not going to grow big and strong Without and all that. Without the protein from meat. But now one of them's 6'4", and one of them's 6'3", and he's extremely athletic and doing just fine. So I think they dropped all their complaints after that was clear. <laughs> so I don't think that it really like would have affected us negatively in any way. Yeah. I mean, not that I noticed anyway. So definitely possible. Our mom was vegan before we were born. She breastfed us. Um, we were all vegan when we were kids, um, us and our two little brothers. And none of us had any problems at all. We were really healthy kids. We never got sick that I can remember. We never even like really had any serious injuries or anything wrong our whole childhood. And our pretty lucky. Pretty lucky. <laughs> and our two brothers are both like six four and six three and most people think that you can't do that on a vegan diet, that you're gonna be small and scrawny and stunt your growth or something. <laughs> but or yeah. somehow turn into a woman from all the estrogen, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we were all breastfed and our mom never had any problems, we never had any problems. I don't think we've ever had to worry about nutrients. Um, we honestly haven't gone to the doctors much, but like recently we actually got blood tests and everything and there wasn't anything missing that they could find. And I know when we were kids, a couple times our mom took us, we never had any like nutritional deficiencies, deficiencies or anything. Like, there was never like a lack of iron or calcium or any of the things people usually yeah. worry about. And the last time we went to a doctor, she specifically, when she found out we were vegan, said that they should test for like the B12 and for everything, and they didn't find anything missing or deficient. Or... And we, nev we never go out of our way to like deliberately have things that have like calcium or iron or B12 or anything like that. Just whatever we eat somehow ends up okay. I think if you just eat a diverse range of foods, you're pretty covered. Um, we use supplements for some things like turmeric and things like that, like if you have like injuries and stuff and you want like anti-inflammatory, but we don't really take like vitamins, piles of vitamins to make up for <laughs> what we're missing. Yeah. I think like maybe some of the misconception is if you go vegan and all you eat is like toast and bread and pasta that you're probably missing a lot of stuff, but if you eat like a lot of fruits and vegetables and grains, it's I think you can get most of what you need from the food that you're eating. Not that we're scientists or know much about it, but it seems to work for us. So, And it's, I've read before that you absorb it better when you get it from food than you do if you get it from vitamins and pills and things. So it seems like the better way to go if you can. See, some things are harder for us because we were raised that way, so we don't have a lot of the difficulties that most people do, um, which I'm always like so impressed by somebody who late in their life just decided that they're going to go vegan or go vegetarian because to me that's a tough decision 
and to come up to the ethical conclusion on your own not being raised that way to me is really impressive. I feel like we had it the easy way because we never had to make the decision on our own. Yeah, so I really admire people who can say that they're going to give up something that they really like for moral reasons. No matter what that thing is, someone who can do that is a really strong person. Um, and to me, I think, the, like we said, we didn't go through it ourselves, but I think the easiest way would just be to start eating food that doesn't have it in it just to see what it's like and to see that it's not necessarily bad or difficult and to slowly start cutting it out. I think some people maybe things are easier if you just cut it off 100% because then you don't keep making excuses or reasons to go back for it. When we decided to go back being vegan, it was easier for us to say like no exceptions at all whatsoever because once you start making exceptions, it's, it's easy, easy to like sneak it in. Like, oh, it's my birthday today or it's Christmas or I'm traveling and it's difficult. But I think for a lot of people, it might be easier to start slowly and just replace one meal at a time a week or just maybe eat vegan food more often and just kind of make a gradual change. At least it kind of seems to work on a lot of our customers because they'll just start coming and they'll start eating more and more vegan food and eventually they realize that it's not horrible Difficult. and it's, I think it helps when they realize it's something achievable, it's something that they're perfectly capable of doing. Um, well, we have a little flyer that um, James actually printed out, which is really useful to give people that has kind of like the vegan alternatives to all the common foods that they could that they could search out. Um, other than that, we don't really have any resources to give people. We kind of recommend them cookbooks maybe or recommend places that they can look for vegan foods. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we kind of just gradually over time learned how to substitute everything. So we don't really, I guess we've never really done like research as to like what you should do to be vegan. So it's harder for us to tell other people how to do that. <laughs> I think a lot of people quit it if it's not like an ethical concern for them because if it's just a health concern or an environmental concern, um, it changes so often what people think is good for you and what people think isn't good for you. So if it's just a diet or if it's just to lose weight or if it's just it's to be healthier. It's easier to go back on it. It's easier to say, okay, I'm healthy now, so it's okay if I cheat, cheat for a little while. I think it's harder to go back on it if it's ethical, your reasons for doing it. Um, I think sometimes people just don't know what to do when they go vegan too. Like we had a friend in college that yeah. um, went vegetarian and he only lasted four weeks. So we're like, only four weeks? And we were talking to him and we're like, what, what were you doing? And he said that he ate literally nothing but like a salad. salad for four weeks, like an iceberg lettuce salad, not even like an interesting salad. Oh, so really? I don't even think I would last for four weeks eating nothing but iceberg lettuce. <laughs> so in that case, it's, I think, just... Uh, a lack of knowledge. A lack of knowledge about what he could eat and what he could do that stopped him from being vegetarian. And I think some people too give up on it because they might say they're vegetarian or vegan and then they're like weak one day or they're traveling one day or something happens one day and they eat something and then all of a sudden they're like, oh, I'm not a vegetarian anymore. It failed. I give up now. <laughs> so yeah. even though it probably doesn't matter if somebody fails, there's no reason to give up on trying and to keep going for it because everyone's going to make mistakes. Even um, I know a lot of vegans make mistakes and eat something by mistake that they didn't realize had dairy in it or there's a new ingredient that they find out had meat or dairy or something. But all everyone can do is the best they can do and have to understand that they're just human so you got to try and that's all you can do. As far as success stories, we already mentioned my boyfriend who ended up going vegetarian just because he liked the food a lot. Um, we had somebody work with us for a little bit who wasn't vegetarian at all or interested in or knew what it was. And after working with us for a while, they became vegetarian. And even though they moved on to better things <laughs> a while ago, they <laughs> moved on to better things, sounds like they died. He got a different job, OK? <laughs> but he, he, <laughs> but he is still a vegan to this day. Um, because he was eating vegan food with us every single day and he saw actually Jim's presentation which made a huge impact on him. So that's a lasting change that he's never gone back on. Um, we've had a lot of success with customers like maybe not dramatic things like someone overnight just decides to go vegan but a lot of people who like thought they didn't like vegan food and would never eat vegan food and thought that was a thing for like hippies and college students or something. <laughs>
ends up changing their mind about it. Or like, we've done a lot of vegan weddings and usually the bride and groom will be vegan and the whole rest of their family isn't. One time they were so mad at the bride and groom because they're like, just because you guys are vegan doesn't mean that you should be inhospitable and make all your guests suffer through eating vegan food. Which for one thing, like eating, not eating meat for one meal shouldn't kill anybody. <laughs> But they're like, you should do regular food for everybody and just get vegan food for you guys. But they decided they wanted to do the whole wedding vegan. So we were helping serve it and cater it. And at the ending, everyone was so happy with the food, even the diehard vegan haters. <laughs> Someone even included like as part of their speeches, like, and I thought the vegan food would be terrible, but it was really amazing. And <laughs> you guys were right. It wasn't so bad. <laughs> that felt really good. We're sitting there like, yeah. <laughs> It's not terrible, but that's something. <laughs> Great praise, no. <laughs> but, um, and like James was mentioning, we had a customer actually move next to this cafe just so they can be closer to the food that they like to eat and make it easier for them, which we, which we didn't know if we were ready for that level of commitment from a customer, but it's, it still makes you really happy. <laughs> I think on a whole, we're really happy anytime someone like enjoys the food and realizes that vegan food isn't bad. Yeah, and, and there's nothing better than making food than watching people eat it and seeing their reactions. And maybe like even at a more basic level, like it's nice to just have people realize that vegan food is just food. <laughs> like it's not vegan food, it's not not me, it's just, it is just food. It, it doesn't have to be any other category. Yeah, which is why I try not to use the word vegan anywhere, not because we don't want to identify ourselves with vegan just because we don't want people to have a conception for what it is. So it is food, that's all it is. <laughs> no. no. Never, never, not for a second. If we look at meat, we literally just see a dead animal. You see flesh, flesh and, and blood, blood and, and fat, and you're like, how is that food? It doesn't look good. It doesn't smell good. It doesn't... I think you have to know what it tastes like to appreciate the smell, because the smell is just like horrible, horrible. and yeah, it's just such like a foreign concept. Like it seems so alien, like yeah. cannibalism. Like, like it'd be the same as eating my arm to me. <laughs> like, <laughs> why would you do that? It's like flesh. It just doesn't sound good remotely. It doesn't even make sense. Like no. why somebody would eat that? <laughs> but, like so. I picture someone walking up to a cow and taking a bite out. <laughs> it's like why? <laughs> Whereas to us, like. If you're walking by an, an orange tree and you just smell it, it smells amazing, you open it up, it looks amazing. It looks like something that you want to eat. You would say oranges. <laughs> yeah, because I love oranges. But <laughs> So part of that might be just the way we're, we were raised, but we just it absolutely doesn't look like food to us. It doesn't look like something that you could eat. And it's really strange that people think that it's food. <laughs> Um, we did try cheese before, so that is one thing I can say was delicious. Like when we stopped eating it, we would crave it. Like when we looked at it, like if our, somebody was eating like a cheese pizza and it would look delicious and it would smell delicious, but then after like a while of not eating it, it stopped. It stopped looking. <laughs> like it was almost like a weird addiction. Like when she stopped eating it you, for a while, you didn't crave it anymore or desire it anymore. It just kind of went away. And now I'm perfectly happy not eating it. I don't miss it at all. Nope. Eating cheese the first time, nasty? Or was it instantly like, oh, this is... That tasted good instantly. Wow. I wish I could say it didn't, but it did. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, like, we've eaten meat only, I think, a couple times that I can remember on accident, either because somebody tried to sneak it to us or... Or there was a mistake somewhere. Um, and each time it tasted terrible. Like we knew right away that someone had something put was wrong. something was wrong because it didn't taste like something we had ever eaten before. Um, eggs and were makes always us disgusting. Sick. Oh yeah, really sick. <laughs> and eggs were always disgusting because we had a job once where we like had to crack it and we opened up the egg and one of the this eggs is had sound stupid, but it had two, two yolks <laughs> and we were sitting there going, "That could have been a twin." <laughs> like this, this was a twin. It could have been a us, but in a chicken form. <laughs> And it, it really hit home, like, this was not good. <laughs> Which is really sad. Yeah. 
That's how we're going to end everything. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it would be nice if, like, we didn't need that kind of emotional connection. Like, if you could just think of it that way to start with. But seeing the twin yolks and the one egg, like, totally horrified and disgusted us. It was like, this is... No. No, 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 no. no. Like I said, it doesn't look like food to us. Not it would remotely. be like if someone saying, like, in order to live, I had to eat her or something. <laughs> like, it's just not worth it. <laughs> yeah, nope. <laughs> and I don't think... Like, I, I know every situation is different for everybody, but I don't feel like thinking that my life is more important than another creature's life. And I know plants are alive too, but at least it's a further distance from our life. <laughs> and I, I can't say like I would think is wrong if someone else did, like if their life genuinely depended on it. Because we've had friends that were vegan before and like something they needed in the hospital required like an animal byproduct of some kind and that was the only option available. Like for a transplant or something, they needed a piece of that came from an animal, and you can't blame them for making that decision to save their husband's life or to save their life. But 99% of the chance when people eat meat, it's not to save their life. <laughs> and I've, I mean, if a doctor said you had to eat meat to live, it's probably wrong. <laughs> I see it. Find another doctor. <laughs> I mean, we've done okay so far. <laughs> something. <laughs> no, my mind just went totally blank. <laughs> I'm going to start quoting like J.R. Token or something random. <laughs> By the way, interesting point. All of the good guys in Token are um, vegan, pretty much, vegetarian. And all the um, bad guys, like the orcs, eat meat. And all the morally ambiguous guys eat fish. <laughs> it's pretty true to life. <laughs> so, so people in general have, have the idea that a vegan or vegetarian society is a good one. They just don't see how they could do it themselves. So even like the Federation in Star Trek, none of them eat meat. It's all just synthetically produced, and the Klingons eat meat because they're kind of barbarians. barbarians. <laughs> so whenever someone thinks of utopia, they think of veganism, even if they don't realize it. It's just they think of it as like a far-off, unachievable utopia, not something realistic that they can actually do. But it's still in most science fiction or fantasies, um, visions of what a utopia is. It's a place where people don't kill. It's always interesting to see what people think is a perfect utopia or a perfect version of the world because people start acting differently if you ask them to make it happen but if they're just thinking purely idealistically what what would be the best world and that's part of the reason we love like reading science fiction and fantasy is because it's a good way to see what people believe removed from like reality like if you removed all the constraints of their normal life what would they think is a perfect world and a lot of the time it involves um, a vegan diet, whether they call it that or not. And even if there's like a world where, or like a made up world where the heroes or the good races aren't vegan or vegetarian, it'll still contrast them to like the barbaric evil societies, which like just eat meat and raw meat or. Yeah. <laughs> because it's obviously like totally barbaric if you eat nothing but meat. <laughs> So most people think that on some level, like that it's uncivilized and it's uncultured and it's barbaric and it's like... But when it comes to their daily life, they don't see it that way, just when they're visualizing a distant future. Oh, I definitely think we will eventually. I think it's going to take a really long time, sadly. But yeah, it's... it takes a long time to change anyone's minds, especially on a huge scale like that. But. It seems like we've made so much progress already because when we were kids, like the only options available were like rice cheese and rice milk and rice ice cream. And you were... said that you were vegan and nobody knew what that meant. <laughs> Most of the places you went to didn't have vegan options. Even if they did, like they might have a salad or something, but it would never be called vegan. Um, now almost everybody at least knows what vegan means and has some concept of it. And you can go to like most major chains or stores and they have a vegetarian or vegan option on the menu. Even Burger King and McDonald's now have vegan burgers. Yeah, so I think it's definitely in the future. Um, and I don't think meat is sustainable long term. Like, 
And also, as sad as it is, because we shouldn't necessarily need the substitutes for it, I think as the substitutes get better and better, it's easier for people to switch over because they don't have to really lose anything. And it, like, I think it'll be like a chain effect. Like, the more it's available, the more people will go vegan, and the more people go vegan, the, the more it's going to be available. So it's just going to get better from there. And like I'm sure like sometime in the distant future, people are going to look back at people eating meat and think of it as like this totally horrible, barbaric thing that they couldn't believe their ancestors did. <laughs> yeah, which will be a good one if we get to that point. <laughs> Our cafe is Anika, Anika Foods. Foods. We're in Wilson, Wilson Manors. We like to make every single kind of food. So it's a lot of Mediterranean food because that's what we were raised with. So like falafel and hummus and shawarma, shawarma and baba ganoush. But we kind of change our menu every week, depending on what we find and what we get excited about. <laughs> so <laughs> we make food from literally everywhere. Or maybe not literally everywhere, but everywhere. <laughs> we, we can. So we do like Korean food, Thai food, Japanese food, Indian Russian food, food Indian food. Um, and we mix them a lot together, which is completely not authentic in any way, shape, or form. But it's really fun to take the ingredients from different cultures and put it together in different ways. So like we have one salad that has millet, but also miso, but also yellow curry and ginger and turmeric and chickpeas. So it's kind of Mediterranean, Indian, Japanese. Japanese. <laughs> or we'll do things with like tahini and wasabi. So just mixing together different cultures and different like cuisines from around the world is really fun. So occasionally just every once in a while it ends up too weird for people yeah. <laughs> like james like that <laughs> like the pink peppercorn um pink peppercorn rose cookies. rose cookies that was a little too much for most people um so that was fun because not a single person no two people out of everyone who came in liked it and everyone else like passionately didn't like it <laughs> so we stopped selling it and we just gave it to people as like a joke like here try this tell me what you think <laughs> So it doesn't always come out good, but we always have fun. <laughs> Sometimes we have too much fun. Like, I'm not sure if it's like good business sense to do that, but it's, we do it more for the fun than anything else. Yeah. And we get the same customers pretty much every day. And if they ate the same food every day, it wouldn't be as interesting for them. So this way they always get to try something different. That's our excuse anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a couple of like the most popular things are like to us kind of boring to make over and over again. Like We make an eggplant parmesan and buffalo cauliflower that people keep wanting, so that we have to make pretty often. Lasagna, we have Lasagna. to make a lot of stuffed shells. But then there's a lot of stuff we make, like I have no idea even how to pronounce it, like japchae, which is a Korean, Korean dish. dish with noodles and like mushrooms and beef or, or beef. <laughs> <laughs> or tteokbokki, which is another Korean dish with like rice cakes and gochujang sauce. So we get to have like a lot of fun experimenting and a lot of creativity doing different things. And fortunately, most of our customers are pretty understanding of that and they're willing to just try whatever it is they see. The substitutes we use for like the beef or chicken de completely depends on what we're making and what flavor would go good with it. But sometimes we'll use soy protein, sometimes like the vital wheat gluten. A lot of times we try to make things like, for me, the burgers that are the best are ones that aren't a substitute for anything, but like a shiitake mushroom burger or a black bean or like a white bean. Beaten quinoa Beats, burgers. Burger. Something that's not trying to be something else. Because a lot of times it's better to just like enjoy the ingredients for what they are instead of pretending to be something else. But sometimes we like using the um, fake meats too. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we try as much as we can to stay away from like the super ultra processed stuff because it's more I think it's more healthy long term and it's better to just have the like the simple ingredients without like yeah. a ton of chemicals and besides if our customers wanted to eat like a Beyond Burger or Impossible Burger it's pretty easy to make at home so we try to make the things that maybe they can't make easily at home either because they can't find the ingredients or don't know how to or haven't tried it yet. Our restaurant, Anika Foods, has only been here a couple years. Um, pretty much we opened right before the pandemic, which was awesome timing. Um, but we've been here for a long time just as like a catering company, so just doing weddings and festivals and events. A lot of farmers markets. Farmers markets and uh -huh. stuff. We've pretty much been doing farmers markets our whole life. Like our parents did it when we were like eight years old. So 
we've literally like grew up, grew up doing it. And they had a cafe when we were little kids, so we pretty much like grew up in their cafe, like cooking and doing things. Yeah. And opening this cafe was actually our um, our mom's idea, but we ended oh. up. We opened it with our mom, but she actually passed away a couple months ago. So it's been kind of like bittersweet, I guess, carrying it on for her. <laughs> yeah. We're only open like Friday through Monday. Because right now there's only about like four of us, I think. So we can only cook a limited amount, but hopefully we'll expand more in the future. Um, like we said, we get to change our menu every day, which is really fun for us. So we spend like a day every week just going around to like different ethnic stores and different farmers markets and different places to and see just what seeing, we can what, find. seeing what kind of weird stuff we could find. Delicious stuff. Weird and delicious stuff. <laughs> um, and so we have an Instagram and Facebook that we post pictures of everything we make if anyone's ever interested in seeing it. <laughs> just Amika Foods. So I guess make sure to check us out on social media or on our website just for the most current hours and times, just in case it changes. On top of having like the entrees and things to go at the cafe, we also do catering. And birthday cakes and special orders um, and special events and weddings. We used to do a buffet dinner once a month that was open to anybody that was absolutely fantastic and so much fun, but we're kind of waiting for the pandemic to die down a little bit more before we start that again. Um, we've gotten to do a lot of fun things like special order cakes for kids that are allergic to dairy, gluten, soy, almond, rice, <laughs> and nuts, and have never had a cake in their life, so that's always really fun to make. So we take a lot of like really weird special requests like that, and it's really fun to like give a birthday cake to a kid who's never eaten cake before. <laughs> Not that that's necessary to their life, but it's, it's fun. So.